Beautiful, beautiful, Dima. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Men of many gifts. Uh, Karna was uh, happy to receive her gifts in the back, and uh, due to the hustle and bustle of changing and things, she just elected to take those gifts in the back. But uh, just know that you're loved, and we're so happy that you're officially a member here at our church. And uh, so she got her certificate and her Bible in the back. So again, welcome. We're glad that you're here. God is good to us, and I hope you've had a good week. But even if you didn't, you're in the right place. Amen? And so today I want to talk to you or share a message with you called What Paul Put on Facebook. And one of the, we're, we're going to get to that message or that part of the message toward the end, but I was fascinated by something that I found this week because I love history. Any other history fans love history? I love history as well. And uh, something that I found in history, and when you unlock certain things in history that relate to the Bible and why certain authors wrote what they did, where they did, it really brings things to a powerful moment for you. And I love it, especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul, because he seems to be speaking so specifically about certain situations and circumstances that it's hard sometimes for us to relate. We don't exactly know what he's talking about. So when you can find these golden nuggets of, of history that unlock, unlock why Paul was saying a certain thing in a certain time, the entire letter opens up. And I found one of those this week. I found one of those historical nuggets, and we're going to get there here in just a minute. But before we dive into our message entitled, What Paul Put on Facebook, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, please join us with your Holy Spirit. Please open our minds and our hearts, Lord, to know that the only one we should be seeking approval from is you, and that faithfulness is the most important thing in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Paul is often viewed as this strong, pompous, enigmatic figure. You know, this rough exterior and just was willing to shout truth and state truth and make sure that things were followed properly in the early church and that he had this invincible character that could never be broken through. And we see elegant teaching in 1 Corinthians. If, uh, if you are able to read Greek and you went through that course in, in school, you know that 1 Corinthians is just, it's a beautiful letter. It's well written, it's poetic in places, it's cogent, it's flowing, it's articulate, it's well thought out. 2 Corinthians is something that is completely opposite. 2 Corinthians has starts and stops, it's disjointed, it has ramblings in some places, and it sounds like a person who has experienced emotionally, emotional scarring that he's been battered and he's mentally exhausted. And there's a good reason for that. Bible scholars believe that 2 Corinthians was written while Paul was in prison in Ephesus. And he was experiencing all of the things that an extended prison stay, the effects that they would have. That an extended prison stay would have. Well, what happened? Well, the first time that he visited Corinth in 50 or 51 AD, Paul spent about 18 months there in Corinth. And uh, Corinth is, it was an interesting place in the first century. It has access to three different seas. Have you ever been in a, a port town, a harbor town? They are interesting. They bring in a whole lot of interesting characters. You have people that, are, that live life basically on the sea or on shipping lines. You have rough folks. You have uh, government people because they're wanting to make sure that trade is done appropriately. You have all sorts of different mixtures of different cultures and different races because these ports bring them in. 
This was the culture of Corinth. It was very, very Roman at the time. Rome had taken a real stronghold in Corinth in Paul's day. It had about 80,000 people in the city. And people of all different religious persuasions. They had pagans, they had Jews, agnostics, Stoics, and others. It was a real mixture of people and, and, and perspectives. The issue with the church in Corinth was that the church had an awful time changing their thinking from being what they had been before they were Jesus followers. So whatever the makeup of these people were, largely Roman, they had a real hard time thinking like a Christian. The Jews that were there, even though some of them were Romans, the Jews had that same difficulty. They had a hard time getting the worldview of just a Roman citizen living in the Roman culture out of their head and becoming Christians, thinking like Jesus would want them to. So Paul, and actually this is what a lot of people don't know, there's historical evidence to believe that Paul actually wrote the church of Corinth at least four times. He wrote letters to Corinth at least four times. We have two in the Bible. The others apparently have been lost. But there's historical evidence to believe that he wrote them at least four times. And what Paul, it's interesting, what Paul would do is that when he'd come into a new city, he would first go to the synagogue and he'd teach in the synagogue. And almost every time what would happen was that the synagogue leaders wouldn't be able to stomach what he was teaching. And what the synagogue leaders would do was they wouldn't expel Paul on their own. They would be in re relationship or in partnership with the local town Roman officials. So they would stir up trouble. They would say, Paul is stirring up trouble in town. Get the dander up of the Roman officials, and the Roman officials would come and deal with Paul. So Paul often spent as much time as he could in the synagogue teaching in the homes until the religious leaders had had enough of what he was saying, and then they would go to the Roman officials, whine and cry to the Roman officials, use their backhanded politics to get Paul arrested or thrown out of town. That was the way it was over and over and over again. So after Paul leaves Corinth, he goes to Ephesus, and this exact same thing happens, except Paul did not have a short prison stay in Ephesus. He was there for an extended period of time. He was in jail for at least a year. And he writes both of his letters to Corinth while he's in prison in Ephesus. The first letter to Corinth is early on in his prison stay. That's why he has his mental faculties. That's why he is uh, thinking free-flowing and his thoughts are cogent and he's just articulate and it's so well written. Second Corinthians is written after and something happens. Word gets back to Paul that the Corinthians don't want to listen to him anymore. They don't want to pay attention to him anymore. They have this perspective. You know, that was nice. Paul came and he got us going. He got things started. He got the church he began the church here, but you know, he doesn't really fit into the culture here. He doesn't really fit, he doesn't speak the way we want him to speak, because think about this, Corinth was also a very wealthy town. This was a wealthy town, and they would be wanting people who look a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way, not a guy who's stuck in prison who only lives off from the offerings of the church in order to keep him surviving. He didn't fit what they wanted him to be. So Paul gets word that they don't want to listen to him anymore. They don't even want him to come back and speak anymore. 2 Corinthians reveals what scarred Paul so deeply. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have your Bible, turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5. I love finding the real Bible <laughs> characters. You say characters, but they're not just characters. They're real people. I love finding the real Paul. Not just the teacher Paul, but the real Paul. The real humans behind these stories. And that's what we're finding here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5 says this. Indeed, 
I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. You ever see that word before? I, I, maybe I've read it before, but it's never really stuck out to me until this week when I was studying into this. Super apostles. Paul uses the term super apostles. And, and if you continue to read there, he paints this picture that apparently these people came into town and they were like superheroes. They were well-dressed, they were articulate, they had all the words, they had the, the relationships, maybe they were wealthy. They were exactly what the church in Corinth was looking for. And the church in Corinth is like, why would we listen to Paul when we have these guys? They fit the mold. Why would we want to listen to, first of all, Paul called out a whole lot of stuff in 1 Corinthians. He called out social issues and spiritual weakness and sexual immorality and racism and infighting. He called all that stuff out. So you have Paul calling that stuff out from prison, and then they have these super apostles come in, and they look the part, and they sound the part, and they say things that are pleasing to their ears. And word gets back to Paul that they don't want to listen to Paul anymore. And Paul says here in verse 5, he says, Look, I'm telling you that I have no reason to believe that I'm inferior to these super apostles. Why are you thinking that? And then we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30. Listen to what he says. If I must boast... I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father, the Lord Jesus, He has blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Eretus was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. This is where that little historical, golden historical nugget comes in. Paul is referring to this instance in his life to show them that they are thinking the wrong way about their Christian faith. In Rome, in ancient Rome, there was an award given in the Roman army. And it was called the Corona Muralis. The Corona Muralis. And it was a crown given that every time there was a battle, the first Roman soldier over the wall into the enemy territory was given the corona muralis. It was a high honor in Rome. And here Paul says, I had to be let down over the wall in a basket. So if you're thinking like a Roman, think about how they think about their leaders. They're the first ones over the wall. They're articulate. They're strong. Think about their statues. Think about the monuments that they set up to themselves. In fact, Caesar had something he called the Evangelon, which we translate to the gospel. They used that same word that Christians used. But their gospel was the strength of Caesar, the strength of the army, all of their accomplishments. Roman leaders would build monuments, and on their monuments they would inscribe all of their accomplishments so they'd be etched in stone throughout all of history. Their version of good news was strength and honor and political influence and relationships and all of these wonderful achievements that these, these, these leaders had made. And Paul says, look, I'm going to boast. I'm going to boast, and let me boast this way. You remember King Eretus? Well, I was the one that had to be let down in a basket over the wall because I was running for my life. That's my boasting. Do you see the difference there? What is Paul driving at? We have to keep, keep reading. Paul contrasts himself, having been lowered over the wall to run for his life, with the corona muralis. He's saying, I'm qualified because I had to run for my life. Romans say you're qualified if you're the first one over the wall. And these super apostles apparently had that same bravado. We're the first ones over the wall. We're wealthy, we're strong, we're well-educated, we're articulate. Why would you listen to that guy who's in, in rags in prison? 
eating with rodents. Why would you listen to him? Paul points out the fact that they are thinking like Romans and not Christians by giving them an entirely different list of accomplishments. He ends with the Corona Muralis comparison, but there's a passage of Scripture that's referred to often, but most people don't pick up on why Paul's mentioning it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 16. These are Paul's accomplishments. This is what he's putting up against the leaders of Rome as his accomplishments. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if I do, accept me a fool, for I too may boast a little. Okay, you super apostles, you Roman leaders, you can boast. We've seen how you boast. Paul says, I'm about to boast. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. There it is. Your thinking's wrong. You're thinking according to the super apostles. You're thinking according to the way of the Romans. You think their accomplishments are true accomplishments, but what Paul's saying, they're not true accomplishments in the eyes of heaven. Verse 20, For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours of you, or takes advantage of you, or puts airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? These super apostles, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they the servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I, have, I am talking like a madman with far greater labors. Far more imprisonments. Okay, we're going to get into that in just a second. But what he's saying here is, yeah, you have these super apostles. You think you should listen to them. This is a broken man, friends. This is a broken man whose heart is broken in half. For the church that he started, and these people come in and they boast all of these wonderful accomplishments and that they're political and they have friends and they get things done politically and they, they, they dress well and they're articulate. This is a broken man saying, look... What you think is valuable isn't really valuable. Faithfulness is what's most valuable. And then he goes on, he says, let me put my resume up against theirs. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? So am I. So I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. How is he talking like a madman? Because he's about to give them a list of things that don't make sense if you're putting them on Facebook. What Paul's about to put are not things that you put on Facebook or put on your resume. Paul's about to build a resume about how, how worthy he is to preach the word of God to them, not based on being over the wall first. Based on many other different things. Verse 24, well, verse 23. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, and I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? For is, who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. If you've ever been a pastor, you know exactly what's in Paul's heart right here. You labor and you strive and you work and the church still rejects you. And Paul says, look, my resume is not built up by all the accomplishments of these 
well-dressed, well-polished preachers. My resume is built up on the fact that I've been faithful through all of that. Through all of it. You see, what Paul put on Facebook (laughs) were his most embarrassing, weak moments of suffering. We don't do that, do we? We don't do that. I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying, that's not what you put out there. That's not what we put out there. We, we, We try to be like super apostles, don't we? And I'm not saying don't celebrate things and don't show people the happy things of your life. But Paul's saying, look, faithfulness is what's most important. It's not keeping up with your neighbors. It's not seeking the approval of other humans. That's not what this is about. This is about being faithful to Christ and His call. That's what's most important to Paul. Previously, they didn't like what Paul had to say and how he corrected them and redirected them and asked them to change. And so when these super apostles came along, they said, why would we listen to a guy who's in prison and beat up? Isn't socially accepted. Doesn't glad hand the powerful people. They gravitated to leaders who didn't have the right message, but were better better resembled a Roman leader. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1 because he goes on with his argument here. He says, I must go on boasting. <laughs> boasting of being shipwrecked? Really? Who boasts of that? Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows, and I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, and he heard things that cannot be told, which a man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. Though I should, I, I should wish to boast, I would not be a field. He's talking about his conversion, where he saw Jesus. That third heaven is being in the presence of God. In the ancient days, they believed there was different degrees of the the atmosphere and the cosmos. And the the first degree was basically our sky. The second heaven was the outer space. And then the third heaven was God. He said, "I I, I saw Jesus. I was in that third heaven. He goes on, he says, verse 5, Indeed, I consider that I am not least... Oh, I'm in 12. Um... Verse 6, though I, though I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for if I would be speaking the truth, but I must refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. <laughs> you know what he's talking about? Some kind of physical ailment that he had that never went away that he prayed would go away, but never was taken from him. Some people say that it was partial blindness. He used to be very well dressed. When he was a Pharisee, he probably had some money. And he had a side job. He was a tent maker. He probably started out his ministry very well dressed. But as time went on and he was relying solely on the offerings of the, the church, his clothes started to deteriorate. The more time he spent in prisons and being shipwrecked and you know, kicked out of towns and having to walk everywhere he went, I'm sure his clothes really began, began to be tattered. And, and so he, by the time he gets to Corinth, he doesn't look like what they would want. But the fact of the matter is, Paul says, I'm exactly what you need. Because what's most important is not how you dress. What's most, most important is not all these worldly accomplishments and all these political allies and all these friends in high places. That's not what's most important. What's most important is faithfulness to the call of Christ. And we can get so caught up in other things. Did you know that there is a direct correlation between how much we compare ourselves to others and the rate of depression, unhappiness, and suicide? 
in the world of social media, this is skyrocketing. There's been numerous studies done on this recently. That more social media use, less happiness. Because you're constantly comparing to others. You ever be scrolling through and you see somebody's vacation? You're like, I can't afford that. And it was unintentional. You didn't even expect it. You know, you weren't on Facebook to compare yourself to anybody, but there you are, and there you know, living it up in Cancun. And you're like, all I can afford is a staycation, and I can barely afford that. And so this, this comparison, this, this longing for affirmation and approval and, and putting some, this false facade out there for people to admire and, and just this fakeness that we're all tempted to believe in also tempts us to look for that in those we want to respect. We want them to resemble the fakeness that we want to put out. You follow what I'm saying there? We want them to look like the fake person that we want others to think that we are. And it's, it's nonsense what we do to ourselves and to others. What's most important is faithfulness. Faithfulness to the call of Christ. That's what's to be admired. That's what commends us in heaven and before the world. What would Paul put on Facebook? The Romans would put, here's my fancy new suit. Paul would put, well, here are my latest prison clothes. Romans would post, here's the latest city we conquered. And Paul would post, pray for this new group of believers because we've been thrown out because of the synagogue council. Now, I don't want to be a, a, a joy kill either. There are times to celebrate and rejoice and, and be able to share with others that we love, things that we've accomplished. Don't get me wrong on that but it's so easy to take it too far. It's so easy to want to put out a false facade and to begin to value the wrong things. And that's what these, the church in Corinth did with these super apostles. They valued the wrong things. This isn't an issue of humility. It's an issue of faithfulness and what we see the purpose of the calling of a Christian to be. Paul says, faithfulness to Christ and his call is what is worth trusting about and posting on. Romans think differently. Faithfulness to Jesus and his call. Now that's something worth talking about. What if that became the most joyous discussions we have with each other? Faithfulness to God's call. What if that was the thing we valued the most in God's church? Faithfulness to God's call. What if that's the, things that, the thing that we taught our children to value the most? Faithfulness to God's call. When we train ourselves to look for faithfulness to Jesus, it protects us from getting sucked into the world of approval and affirmation and valuing the wrong things. Let us never become like Corinth and kick Paul out because we're looking for the wrong things. Let us value faithfulness to the cause of Christ. And may that be our vision that Jesus gives us. Amen.